I knew making this list would be tough, and it was. Narrowing down all of my favorite superhero films down to 25, I know, was hard. And I had to do it now, especially before the summer hit, and we were hit with a shitload of more superhero movies that you know within the next two or three years, this list will not look the same. We're going to get some badass, awesome, epic superhero films. So let's jump right into it. Starting the countdown at number 25. The Wolverine. And The Wolverine, I have this on my list because this movie was very important. When Fox first tried to do a solo Wolverine movie, X-Men Origins Wolverine, it was very disappointing. I mean, between how much they jumbled his backstory and between how many random mutant characters that was just thrown in there for no good reason, it was a mess. And, and it sucked, right? I mean... You didn't want Wolverine's first solo film and his Weapon X story to be presented like that. And so the fact that they tried it again, another solo Wolverine movie, I have to give them credit. And I also have to give them credit because they made a good one. And I love that they took the Japanese story from the comics and we got to know his character on such a different level. It was the first film in years that took place after X-Men 3, coming in at number 24, Kick-Ass. And Kick-Ass was a movie that, when I first saw it in the theater, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that it had been so long since we got a radar superhero film, not since, what, The Punisher? So I couldn't believe that not only did we get another one with this, but how funny it was. Not everybody's gonna like this, not everybody thinks that this is a good movie, but I liked how it was almost, I don't wanna say a satire, but it's like, let's take Peter Parker's story, for example, and what if that really happened in the real world where a high school kid just started being a superhero? He would get his ass kicked, and he would damn near die. I mean, at the beginning, you see this kid who he tries to be a superhero, but he gets stabbed, gets run over by a car. It's like, fuck, this job is not easy. But then when he meets Nicolas Cage and Chloe Grace Moretz, those two characters, Big Daddy and Hit Girl, were badasses and were awesome. And Chloe Grace Moretz was only like, what, 11 years old? Coming at number 23, Watchmen. Watchmen is a film that, I mean, when you think of the graphic novel, by Alan Moore in the fact that Zack Snyder of all people attempted to adapt this. Kudos! Kudos to Zack Snyder because maybe I've given him shit sometimes for his lack of storytelling, but he didn't really mess too much with the original story. I feel like a lot of this was to the page. And I think the fact that most superhero movies don't do that, how it is usually writers coming in and taking material from over the years and then turning it into a brand new story. This is one of the few where the actual graphic novel was adapted, and I love that. I wish we tried more stuff like that. Sure, this was a huge undertaking, and it didn't please everybody. And some of the characters, like Rorschach, is obviously my favorite. I love him being a detective and trying to figure out who killed the comedian. The comedian, I found to be a fascinating character. I mean, he's a superhero, supposed to be, but he's done some deplorable and fucked up things over the years. Dr. Manhattan, who his sequence of seeing his origin and how he became who he was and how he starts to uh, lose interest in humanity, not relate to them anymore. It's a fascinating character. There's a lot of good stuff in here. It's a very dark film. Again, it's not for everyone, but I enjoyed it. Number 22, Thor. Thor, I almost didn't have on this list until I stopped and realized, wait, I really like this movie. I did, especially when I think of how of what I thought of Thor before this movie. I thought he was cool, you know, he was a god and he had all these powers, but I didn't think it was possible. I did not think it was possible for Marvel to take a character like Thor and make him presentable in the real world. And I'm not saying he's super gritty and realistic, I'm saying that they started their films with Iron Man, who is pretty down to earth when you think about it, not too out there. 
with the superhero in this. But then Thor, they made it work. And I love how they blend the science and magic and the technology and make all that work. I love Chris Hemsworth as Thor. Great casting. I love Tom Hilston as Loki. Uh, you, you don't get any better of a villain than that. And Anthony Hopkins as Odin. Perfect. Natalie Portman I even like as Jane Foster. At number 21, Blade. Blade. I love this movie. Blade is so badass, and when you think about it, it's one of the first, not the very first, but it's one of the first superhero films that at least began the onslaught of superhero movies. This came out in 1998, and after this movie, we got X-Men, we got Spider-Man, we got Daredevil, Hulk, it just, it kept coming. And I think Blade was a big part of that. It's rated R, for one, and it was Marvel's first big hit. And the fact that their first big hit was an African-American superhero, half vampire, half human, so crazy that that worked. And I love Wesley Snipes in the role. He's so badass. He's, he's perfect as his character. I dread the day when they do eventually make a new Blade movie with a new actor. I'm not saying it can't work, but I just there's nobody that I think of besides Wesley Snipes. Number 20... Man of Steel, and this is very controversial, I know. There are some people who hate this movie, who hate the Superman, and I can't really argue, there. I don't think it's a perfect film, but I loved seeing this movie in the theater. I saw it in IMAX, and I, I couldn't believe the spectacle that I was watching. So much action in this film, and when you really stop and think about it, we hadn't had a good superhero, a good Superman movie, in how long? How long? It, it, Superman Returns was not the Superman movie that we wanted. So it had been decades since we got a badass, kick-ass Superman film. And I do feel like this was it. Great action, great villain in Zod. And say what you want to say about the destruction at the end. I, at this point, I just have fun with it. I say, look. Look at how much Superman is finally punching. I don't think he punched once in Superman Returns, but here he's angry and, and he's willing to take the fight to Zod to stop him from killing what would have been billions. I go with it. My only complaint really is, is how the whole Jonathan Kent stuff was handled, but I don't really want to get into that. At number 19, X-Men First Class. And this was a movie where after X-Men The Last Stand, after X-Men Origins Wolverine, I was afraid for the X-Men franchise. I thought Fox was spinning their wheels. They didn't know what they were doing. They, they were lost. And I'm not saying I thought this was, this was going to be as bad because the previews looked good, but I didn't think it was going to be as good as it was. Having it take place in the 60s, I thought, was a great idea. I love period pieces, with, especially with superhero stuff. And the fact that we got so much backstory on Magneto was also needed. We never got the solo Magneto film that I thought that would have been cool, but this was just as good. And Michael Fassbender as young Magneto, you don't get any better than that. I love him as young Magneto, almost James Bond-like, the way he's going after Nazis that, that took out his, his people, his family. I love his story. And... Uh, James McAvoy as young Professor Xavier, how different he was when he was younger, the ladies' man, and using his powers. At number 18, I admit this is probably more because I grew up on this film, but Batman Returns. I, I just, I love this movie. I love watching it as over the top as it is, as silly as it is, and it's funny to say over the top and silly, thinking about Batman Returns, right? Because at the time, People thought it was dark. People thought it was too much. It was, it, it, was, it was crossing the line, especially with the Penguin character. And I admit, sometimes I watch this now and I think, wow, I can't believe they got away with Danny DeVito saying some of these lines that he says. He's dirty, he's perverse, he, he's, he's fucked up in a lot of ways. But I love that. It's, it's just, I grew up on it. It's, it's the first version of the Penguin that I knew. Sure, I don't think it's the definitive version of the Penguin, that's for sure, but I, I still, 
I grew up on it. I love Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman, as silly as her stuff is with the nine lives and being brought to life by cats. Her performance is what sells me. She's hot, she's sexy. I love her and Batman going at it. Even the scene with them at that, that party and they find out that each other, who each other are. Great acting from the two, Michael Keaton as Batman. It's just, it's, it's, it's enough good stuff in there that I think warrants the position. Now at number 17, the Amazing Spider-Man. And yes, I agree that this series was rebooted way too soon, way too early. And I even think that it was unnecessary to do his origin at the time that it did. It was only 10 years after the original movie. And you have to wait the hour and rewatch him getting bit by the spider and developing the powers. Been there, done that. But I do think that it was necessary for the story that they were telling. The fact that they were getting to a different part of Peter Parker's backstory, not only with everything there, but his parents. And the mystery behind his parents, which was something that was never touched on in the original movies, and I only vaguely knew about from the comics, I that was the big selling point for me, to give them the pass on going back to his origin, and I think it worked. I also love Andrew Garfield as Peter Parker, as Spider-Man. Andrew just, he knew how to play the, the dorky, nerdy Peter, loner Peter, while having fun as Spider-Man. I think that was very important. I don't care for the brand new design of the suit. I don't know why they did it. I mean, sure, I guess, let's make it more realistic. But Spider-Man, this isn't the Dark Knight. You don't need to make Spider-Man more gritty and realistic when it comes to his costume. Look at the material. He's fucking bit by a radioactive spider. But I did like uh, that the villain was the lizard, finally. Not only was it somebody different, but the Lizard is one of my favorite Spider-Man villains, so I appreciated that. And Peter Parker's relationship with Gwen Stacy, Emma Stone, I love. She's amazing, and who better than to have as a love interest for somebody to make you not think about Mary Jane. In fact, I came to a point where I said, you know what, if they don't kill Gwen, I wouldn't be upset by that. That's how much I loved Emma Stone. And Captain Stacy. Dennis Leary was great. I loved him in that movie. At number 16, I guess it's debatable on whether or not this is really a superhero movie, but I put it on the list anyways. Chronicle. Sure, it's not based on the comic book. Sure, it's not superhero characters that we all know, but it's basically a superhero movie. I mean, you have these three kids in high school who find this weird ship underground and it gives them superpowers i mean that's basically what this is right and this is one of the few found footage movies that i love it being found footage it made it more realistic and i loved following these characters especially at the beginning having fun with their powers messing around with people it's absolutely what i would do if i had powers like that and then seeing the tragic downfall of the main character, Andrew, and his fucked up life with his father and feeling neglected by everyone and, and seeing him basically become the villain was fascinating. I just, I can't get over how much of a surprise this movie was. And I loved everything about it. At number 15, Captain America, the first Avenger. Now, like Thor, Here's a character that I knew, I grew up with, but I just, I thought he was cool. Until the movie, it wasn't until the movie where I said, wow, this character, there's a lot to him. There's a lot of layers and dimensions to him. Steve Rogers, before he even becomes Captain America, is, is such a, a stand-up guy. As small as he is, as, as much as he gets beat up as he does, he's not willing to back down. He will stand up for something that he believes is right. Seeing him on so many tries, trying to get into the military and keep getting denied and denied, you can't help but admire that and respect that. And when he does become Captain America, he doesn't become an asshole or cocky. He still keeps those virtues and values that make him a great guy. And the Red Skull, what a great villain. Hugo Weaving, 
is awesome as the Red Skull. Uh, I love the makeup effects on his face, how real that looks, and his whole ideology on being more dangerous and evil than Hitler with Hydra and how much Hydra has impacted the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe because of this movie. And it's a period piece. In the 40s, it's just, it took itself seriously, and that's what I like the most about that film. At number 14, another film that I grew up with. Does it deserve the spot? Who really knows? But Batman Forever. <laughs> I love this film. I do. Now this is the Batman movie that is really silly and goofy. It's, hell, it's borderline close to being as silly as Batman and Robin. I admit that. But I still love it. I love Val Kilmore as Batman. Very underrated as Batman. I think he's a great Bruce Wayne. I think he pulls off the Batman persona minus the smiling. That happens. Robin's origin, I love seeing him in the circus and how his parents were killed and Chris O'Donnell, I just, I like how that was handled. It's some of the most serious and darkest stuff in the movie. Tommy Lee Jones is very over the top, I admit that, and I don't really have a good thing to say about him. Nicole Kidman is, is overly sexualized and there's really nothing to her character. But Jim Carrey as the Riddler is awesome. Is he technically or traditionally the Riddler? Who knows? Some people compare him to the 60s Riddler, so maybe that's something. But he just, he's so charismatic, he's so funny, he's so great. It doesn't feel forced like the Two-Face character does. He, he just, he brings that, that funness out of the Riddler character. So what more can I say about that? I, when I was a kid, I, I grew up watching that film over and over again. It was ridiculous. Number 13, Superman the movie. So I'm not counting any of these other films. Sorry. But Superman the movie, it's a classic. Christopher Reeve as Superman, as Clark Kent, is great. He, the way how he pulls off dorky, goofy Clark Kent in front of Margot Kidder's Lois Lane and how she has no idea who he is but loves Superman. I love that. And... Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor. Sure, this isn't the Lex Luthor that I probably think of the most, right? He's not the rich uh, businessman Lex. This is more of the crazy madman scientist Lex. But still, he feels a lot like the Lex that you know how, how what he wants to do. Blow up this side of the world to profit off of it, not caring about the millions of lives that will, that will die. It's, it's still a take on Lex that I can appreciate, and I like the actor. And I also love, more so than anything, how Superman's backstory is, is handled here between Marlon Brando on Krypton and, and that planet blowing up, and then watching young Clark land on Earth and get raised by the Kents and how his father dies. It's, that, that's the Superman that I grew up with. So I had to put it on the list at that high. Number 12, Guardians of the Galaxy. This is a pretty new superhero film. So does it deserve the spot? I think it does. Especially because I knew next to nothing about this property before the film. And who would expect this movie to work? But not only does it work, not only do you just go with the the crazy universe that they established, the aliens and the various different characters, a talking fucking raccoon, a talking tree who only says his name. But Peter Quill, Star-Lord, is awesome. He's a great lead character. The humor in this movie with him and Rocket Raccoon work. I'm constantly laughing in this film, but I'm not laughing in a parody sense. I'm laughing because the material is genuinely funny and it's just greatly written. It's the Star Wars of the new generation. It's my Star Wars. So there you go. At number 11, The Dark Knight Rises. Man, the first time I saw this film, the midnight screening, I, I couldn't believe how dark and depressing the movie was. 
And I think the first time, I, I don't know if I loved the movie the very first time, because it was just absorbing everything and taking it all in. It's, it's not anywhere near as fun as the older Batman movies that I was talking about. But upon rewatching it so many times, you, you grow to appreciate what's in the story, how much is going on, especially with the Bruce Wayne character. How many Batman movies are about Bruce Wayne that's not dealing with his origin? Because it's almost like if you're not dealing with Batman's origin, then the story is not going to be about him. This movie, though, it's about him because it's him dealing with whether or not he can keep being Batman. He was injured. Rachel died. He doesn't want to continue being Batman anymore, but he knows he has to. Because this Bane character is so evil, so threatening, such a serious threat, that he has to come back. And seeing everything that he has to go through to save Gotham, getting his back broken, having to climb out of the pit, this is the Batman triumphant story that you want to see, at least told once. It's very dark, it's very depressing, but it's a story that needed to be told. It's the end of a Nolan trilogy. It, it had to happen. Bane, I love that we made Bane a serious villain. Uh, a memorable villain. I love Tom Hardy and his accent, just everything that comes with the character. Anne Hathaway as Catwoman. I love her take on Catwoman. She's she's even more true to the character than I think we've ever seen before. Uh, John Blake, that character was something I wasn't expecting, and I guess technically he's the gritty, realistic version of Robin, which I can enjoy. And number 10. So now we're in the top 10 category. Here we go. Batman 89. This is a film that I can admit, when I was really young, uh, I, I liked the movie, but I didn't love it. I was more of a, let's watch Batman Returns and Batman Forever. Just more happened, I guess, in that movie. But then when I got older and I rewatched this, I was like, wow, I love this movie. Jack Nicholson as the Joker, sure, you've heard me say that with the Joker, I, I'm not thrilled about getting his backstory, but here, I just, I think it makes sense, you know, it's not like you're seeing the Joker as a kid, you're seeing him moments before he becomes the Joker, and he was a part of this mob, and, and his boss basically screwed him over, and then Batman's attack, he falls into the vat of chemicals, seeing Jack become that crazy, murderous psychopath, laughing maniacally, and the bleached skin, and the permanent smile. This is the craziest I've seen Jack be, and, and I mean, we're talking about a guy who made The Shining. He's just, he's so crazy in this movie. The scene where he kills one of the mobsters, and he's just bones there, and he, and Joker's talking to him, laughing as he does. I'm glad you're dead. Michael Keaton as Batman, but his Batman is spot on. He's so serious. He's so dark. The moment at the beginning when he grabs those two thugs on the roof, especially the one he grabs, and he's like, I'm Batman. Tell the whole city about me. Uh, number nine. X-Men 2 United. I, I almost had this higher on the list because for years this was in like my top five favorite superhero movies of all time. This was my favorite X-Men movie ever because not only is it the best, I think the best X-Men movie that handles all of the characters as well between Jean going through her craziness and not knowing how to control her powers and of course at the end of the movie she sacrifices herself and dies. but. Uh, you have Storm stepping up and establishing herself as a leader to the kids. You have Professor X, you have Cyclops, who, okay, Cyclops, <laughs> he is wasted in this movie. I admit that. I like the stuff with Rogue and Iceman trying to be in a relationship. Wolverine, of course, this is the X-Men Origins Wolverine movie that, that was it. I mean, we didn't need... A prequel movie after this. We got the flashbacks, we got the Weapon X stuff, uh, we got the William Stryker character that I think was the best 
out of any other ones that we had. I love how he shows up and it messes with Wolverine. He, he he's conflicted. He doesn't have his memory. He doesn't know if if he should trust this guy. He is curious about his past, though. Even Magneto, who was the villain in the first movie, isn't the villain here. But he's present and he's very much a big factor because he's playing his strings. He's pulling the strings. He he knows how to manipulate certain people to get what he wants. I love that the movie starts with him in that plastic jail cell. I love it. And the introduction of Nightcrawler. I say introduction, but it's the only movie he's ever been in, which kind of sucks, but he's so memorable in this one film. The beginning in the White House when he's trying to kill the president. I love the effects. For 2003, the effects were awesome. And it came to CGI and the makeup. I love it. There's probably stuff I'm forgetting about with this movie. There's, there's so much great stuff in here. Awesome. At number eight, Spider-Man, the original. I do love this movie. I like Tobey Maguire as Spider-Man. I do. I think he pulls off the nerdy, geeky Peter Parker better than Garfield because I look at Toby and I buy him more as a nerd. I do. And him being awkward around Mary Jane, I buy it. And Mary Jane, people shit on uh, Kirsten Dunst for Mary Jane or that, oh, she's not pretty enough or, oh, she's not this and she's not that. Look, Kirsten Dunst is a good actress and that's all I cared about. She's here. I think in the first movie especially, she's written the most like comic book Mary Jane. The way how she is with, with her parents, her father abusing her, and you know, she she wants, she has these aspirations to be an actress. I love the friendship between Peter Parker and Harry Osborn, the fact that it's established in this first movie, so we actually take our time before we just throw him into becoming the villain. And uh, Norman Osborn, William Defoe as the Green Goblin is awesome. He's great. Just watch the scene where he's talking to himself in the mirror as two different personalities. That's how you know you have a great actor in your movie. That he can do that, he can pull that scene off, make it work, and it doesn't come off as silly or goofy. It comes off as scary. And you kind of feel bad for the Norman Osborn character, even though he's killing people, he's loving it, he's enjoying it. It's crazy what his character is all about, especially when you can't tell when the real Norman is present. People complain about the costume. I, I'm not saying it's, it's my favorite Green Goblin costume ever, but they did what they could for 2002. I mean, sure, William Dafoe has the perfect face for a Green Goblin, so that would have been something to see, but still, I love this film. I do. I J. J. Jonah Jameson, I love his scenes. I, I love it. Uh, the the killing, the death of Uncle Ben. It it hits me more in this movie than it does in the reboot. I don't know if that's just because it was first, but you you really you really grow attachment to the Uncle Ben character here and the whole speech with great power comes great responsibility. How many times was that quoted? after this movie. At number, what are we at? Seven? Seven. Iron Man. You have to put the original Iron Man on this list. Mostly because I can remember, it wasn't that long ago, I can remember when the trailer for the first Iron Man came out and I was thinking, wow, Iron Man, like when was the last time I seen that character? I saw him in the cartoons when I was a kid and stuff and I couldn't believe they were making a movie out of it. And then I thought, well, could that work? Could this character work? He's like Marvel's B or C list. I see the trailer, though, and it looked pretty badass. I see the movie. It's even more badass. Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark, he was born to play Tony Stark. I don't care how old he was or how many movies he did beforehand. This is the character that he was meant for. And I love it. I love him at the beginning being this cocky, douchebag, rich guy character who is not even aware of what his weapons company is doing behind his back. And it's not until he gets kidnapped, gets his heart ripped out, and 
and he has to build his own way out, build a suit to get out of here. And, and that's when he wakes up. That's when he realizes just how bad it is, what type of people have his weapons, and he devotes himself to stopping this from protecting the people that he feels like he's helped hurt. And I love that. That's seeing his character, his road to redemption is is great. At number six, here we go. X-Men Days of Future Past. So I said that for years, X-Men 2 was my favorite X-Men movie, and that was the case. I never thought it would get better than that until this movie happened. Wow. It's This was Fox saying, hold on guys, don't lose faith in us. We can do it. Just give us a chance. I know we fucked up. I know, I know you're pissed off. We're going to make things right. And I'm not just saying finally bringing in the Sentinels, which was something I've wanted since that cock tease scene in The Last Stand. And I don't just mean bringing the original cast back, which was awesome. Ian McKellen, Patrick Stewart. That was great. Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. Seeing that original group back was great. Mixed in with the first class cast also was awesome. But how they were able to balance all of these characters. Wolverine never felt like he was taking over the show. Seeing this story basically about saving Mystique and stopping her from going down that dark road, that dark path that she's supposed to go on. I love that as well. The Quicksilver scene? What? For everyone who was shitting on Quicksilver for how goofy he looked and the jacket and just and how dumb they thought it was going to be, he had the best scene in the movie, the most memorable, the funniest. I can't wait to see more with his character in future sequels. And that ending. The ending was the most satisfying ending to any superhero movie ever. And I'm okay with saying that because when you see the future saved, and you see not only our main group back, our main characters back, Rogue, Kitty Pride, uh, Beast, but you see Jean Grey, who is saved from the whole Phoenix saga. Thank you. Fuck you, Brett Ratner. That never happened. Cyclops was saved. It's just, thinking about it gives me chills. And number five, my top five favorite superhero movies. Captain America The Winter Soldier. How is this movie not higher on the list? I know, I'm saying that myself, but this is great. This film, Captain America, you're thrusting him into our present day, so he's dealing with that. He's dealing with his way of thinking and how the world was 70 or so years ago and to how it is now. Seeing him have to work with Nick Fury and Black Widow, two people who aren't like soldiers like him and who are willing to get down and dirty and do some things, unethical things that he doesn't appreciate. So seeing all that was great. But then what happens with S.H.I.E.L.D.? Wow. I, I defy somebody to lie and say that they knew that that was going to happen going into this movie. I could not believe that Hydra was infiltrating S.H.I.E.L.D. this whole time and that S.H.I.E.L.D. basically fell in this movie. Sometimes you hear that some of these Marvel movies, you can do the one and done stories or movies and it makes a lot of money, but it doesn't really change the overall landscape. It doesn't change anything in the universe. It's just, it's everything has to stay the same until the next Avengers movie. That's what we probably thought until this film. And this changed everything. I love that. I love that shock factor. And we have to talk about the Winter Soldier because Bucky as the Winter Soldier, I loved him as this character, this badass Terminator-like assassin who has been programmed and used by Hydra for years and years. He doesn't even know who his best friend Steve Rogers is and seeing Captain America try to get to him and stop him. He's just, he's a great villain. I love the end fight with him, especially where Captain America is refusing to hit him back and fight him back. Anthony Mackie as the Falcon is hilarious, a great sidekick, and I almost don't want to call him a sidekick because he was that likable as a character. Number four, Batman Begins, which 
I mean, this is it, right? This is the best Batman origin story that we're ever going to get. I feel bad for anyone who tries to do another one. Whether it's 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, you're not going to get a Batman, a better Batman origin story than this. This is so, not just because it's gritty and realistic, not just because of that, but because of the time and the effort and how careful Chris Nolan was in developing and, and presenting Batman's story. I love the flashbacks, how this story is out of order, and you get not only his parents being killed, but him in those different countries being trained by the League of Assassins or Ra's al Ghul. I love that, him coming back to the city, becoming Batman. We, we finally see how, where he gets his wonderful toys and him developing the suit, him working with Lucius Fox, him beginning a partnership with Jim Gordon, I love. The Scarecrow, sure, he's not as much of a presence as I might like, but for what he does here, he's great. Killian Murphy, that's how you can tell that they picked the right guy who can make an impression like that in such little time. I love him with the mask and the gas and, and just what he does to Batman especially, setting him on fire. And then Liam Neeson as Ra's al Ghul, awesome. <laughs> Awesome. Liam Neeson has played some badass characters over the years, but I'm going to say now, none better than being the man who trained Batman. At number three, Spider-Man 2. This is the best Spider-Man movie ever. And I love it. Not just because it's from the original series, but because this is classic Spider-Man. This is the Spider-Man that we feel bad for, right? We see everything that he's doing for New York. How he's constantly out there saving people, putting his life on the back burn. He's risked his relationship with Mary Jane, his lack of relationship with her. She's going to go off and get married to somebody else. He's dealing with that. He's, he's hurting in school, in his grades, but he's doing all this to be Spider-Man. And that's what you love about the character. Even him sort of mentally having trouble with whether or not he still wants to be Spider-Man. The Spider-Man No More stuff, I love. But then you get Dr. Octopus as the, the main character, the main villain. This is what I liked about these Spider-Man movies, is that we focused on one fucking villain. Is that so hard? Do we have to have three villains in one movie? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to yell. But it's just... This is why I loved these original movies so much, is because we can take so much time, spend so much time dealing with one villain and, and just seeing why he becomes who he becomes and what he's after. We feel bad for him. We relate to him. We say, okay, you know, he's doing some heinous things, but we understand it. And so that makes it that much more awesome seeing Spider-Man fight a tragic villain like that but an actual tragic villain, not a forced one. The scene that where they fight each other on the train. How many times do you hear people talk about how epic that scene was? It's because it was. It's, it's one of the best fight scenes in a superhero movie, especially involving a train. And I love it. The stuff with Harry Osborn just going off the deep end, hating Spider-Man, and letting his friendship with Peter Parker get messed up because of it, and he's just obsessed with finding him. All of the stuff with him finding out who Spider-Man is in this movie, I love. I love. And people can say that Mary Jane is annoying in this movie. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying I don't get pissed at her. I get it. She doesn't know that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, so she just thinks that he lies to her all the time. I try to understand where she's coming from. So I don't dislike her in this movie as much as I do in the third one. <laughs> so there you go. Now, for my top two favorite superhero movies of all time. Number two, The Avengers. Wow. <laughs> I never thought I would see the day when The Avengers was a live action movie. It, you know, growing up as a kid and you watch all these cartoons and these animated shows, you watch Spider-Man and all these superheroes showing up to help each other out, and you think, wow, that's cool. As a kid, you're probably just saying, oh, wow, 
superheroes. When do you ever think that's really going to happen in live action? When do you ever think that not only the technology would be there, but that they would do it right? The fact that Marvel built this up and in the end credits of Iron Man, having Nick Fury say the Avengers Initiative, like we all, all of my friends got giddy and we said, could they actually be doing this? How would that work? We just, we couldn't wrap our heads around it. So when this day finally came and all of my friends and I went to the midnight screening and that crowd, that atmosphere, it was electric. I, I'll never forget what it was like to be in that screening for this movie and, and how much fun we had, how much of a ball it was, how fun this movie was, how entertaining it was, how much all of the characters worked well against each other, bounced off each other. I know every superhero movie seemingly has a battle in New York. So, poor New York. But still, this, it went on for like a good hour. And I loved it. It Crazy special effects. It, it looked so real. The little kid in me just came out and, and this was it. If this was the last movie that Marvel ever made, I would have said it was worth it just for this film. I love going back and rewatching this, even if it is just for that last battle. Wow. But it's now time to talk about my all-time favorite superhero movie. It's probably pretty obvious by now. The Dark Knight. The Dark Knight is not only the best Batman movie that's ever been made, but the best superhero movie. This is just a great movie in general and that's where I think this separates itself from any other film because all of these other movies I love clearly I've been talking about it forever but there's no other superhero film where you can take it apart and just review it critique it as its own movie all across the board the writing the storytelling the characters the layers of depth and and how dark it gets First of all, Heath Ledger as the Joker. Remember when people were bitching, oh, Brokeback Mountain, really? Ten Things I Hate About You, really? A Knight's Tale, really? Well, this fucking guy owned it as the Joker. And now, what are we saying? We're saying we feel bad for the next guy who has to follow Heath Ledger. That's how he took a character, the Joker, who was great from Jack Nicholson, but he did his own thing with it. He made it even more dark. He made it even more scary and murderous and psychotic and unpredictable. You couldn't tell what this fucking guy was going to do next. And that's what I loved about him. And he was also fun to watch. As crazy as he was, as evil as he was, he was fun to watch. And that's what the Joker is. Even though it's he's wearing makeup, even though he might not be traditionally comic book Joker. He is the essence of the Joker. And he is my favorite version of the Joker. Christian Bale as Batman, I love. I love that this is Batman in his prime. This is kind of the only movie where we get Batman in his prime for the Nolan films. And, and I think people forget about Bale because of how great Ledger is. Aaron Eckhart as Harvey Dent. We finally got a Harvey Dent, a Two-Face story that works, that's tragic, that you feel bad about watching because you're seeing this stand-up great guy who was great for the city just fall and just become something. He becomes everything that he was fighting against. And that is a tragedy in and of itself. I love Aaron Eckhart. Also an underrated performance in this film. Seeing him become the evil Two-Face at the end and how far he goes. Great stuff. I... I can talk about this movie for days. It, in fact, it makes me want to, whenever I do talk about it, it makes me want to sit down and watch it again. I don't care that it's two and a half hours. It doesn't feel like it. The score, Hans Zimmer, I, <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love this film. The Tumblr, when it becomes the, the Bat motorcycle, <sighs> what more can I talk about? I will be surprised when the day comes, if the day ever comes, if a superhero movie can be better than this, I don't know if it will ever happen. Anyways, guys, that's my very long video of me talking about my favorite superhero films, my top 25 favorite. 
Let me know in the comments below not only what you think of my list, but what's your all-time favorite superhero movie? Like, comment, subscribe. Later.